Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night uh, teaching. And today we wanted to talk a little bit about, um, actually let me flip over here. We wanted to talk a little bit about the canon. The reason I picked this subject is uh, uh, Ezra and the close of the New Testament canon uh, is because um, several people have asked when we make books like uh, available, uh, like Jasher and Gad the Seer and things like that, if you're thinking those, especially something like Gad, if you're thinking that's real, if that's a prophet and the book mentioned by the Old Testament, then I'm adding to the canon. And that's something that uh, we're not supposed to do. So I get that a lot. Uh, if I go to a uh, church and talk about, um, for instance, I believe in a seven-day literal creation, I'll usually get the, thank God, somebody really believes the Bible. And then I'll start supporting that evidence by saying Josephus says this, this says this, some science says this, and I'll get looked at really funny, like, why are you adding to the scriptures? And so we have to ha understand this. The concept, and I'll just explain it to you real quick, and then I wanted to look at the source of where this legend, so to speak, comes from. And the idea is people constantly ask the wrong questions, kind of. They, they basically say, well, who added to the New Testament or took away from the New Testament or who decided what books go in the New Testament and what about the lost Gospels and who took them out and what happened with that. And those are all kind of misnomers. Basically, the way this works, if you just think about Moses for a minute, uh, Moses uh, led the exodus, caused the plagues, or the Lord through Moses did the plagues, made the uh, river uh, blood red, uh, caused the locusts, the hail, the darkness, the death of the firstborn. And when Moses uh, instructed him to, uh, when God instructed Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, uh, there was a pillar of fire, a pillar of smoke, uh, the people that attacked them were destroyed by locusts and all sorts of other things. I mean, there was one miracle after another. Now, if you were there at that time and you saw that, you would know undoubtedly that God was working through the hand of Moses. So when Moses turns around at this point then and writes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy and says that these are inspired, he's proven himself by... The miracles that he does. And so as you go on, the next will be Joshua, writing Joshua. And then you've got Joshua, Judges, from the Judges time, multiple ones like that, and on down. So what you have is a prophet that's proving themselves to be a prophet of God by their miracles. Much like the same time when, when you get people coming up saying, the Lord told me to tell you, you need to support my ministry, you need to give me money, you need to do this, and you need to do that. Most of us usually look at them and say, well, I believe in prophets, so it's a possibility. What proof do you offer that you're not just somebody making this stuff up? They usually get mad and tell you that you're coming against a prophet, you know, something like that. Bottom line is, if they prove themselves as a prophet and tell me what I'm supposed to do something, I'll still compare it to Scripture, but you just don't tell, uh, accept, and obey someone who tells you something. And we definitely wouldn't add to the canon. So this is what's going on. Now, in our time frame, we've had lots of cults, um, even just like looking back in the 1800s and going up. We've had several cultic groups that have tried to create their own Bibles, add different books to the Bible. Some of them have the other testament of Jesus Christ or other things like that. And what they would need to do is to prove themselves that they really are prophets uh, by a series of miracles in front of everyone. Uh, and then we would think about adding something like that to the canon. And none of these, none of these uh, cults can do that. And so the concept is that each time uh, a prophet rose up and said, this should be added to the canon or this should not be added to the canon, this is the rule and guide of faith, uh, they would successively be added. And no one would debate this because these prophets, like Elijah, did all sorts of miracles. So we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, written by Moses, Joshua by Joshua, and then Judges 
Ruth, and then you got 1 Samuel. Samuel was a prophet, heard from God. So Samuel, uh, Kings and Chronicles written by the prophets and other people okayed by the prophets. And then you've got the, the prophets in general, which ends with Malachi. So the story that is told by the early church fathers, by the Talmud, and by the um, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, is that the prophets control what's added to scripture. So we start with uh, Moses, and we go on down through the prophets. The last prophet was Ezra. And Ezra through, and we're talking about Ezra and Nehemiah in that time period, when they come back from Babylon. Ezra, at this point, through divine revelation, seals the canon. In other words, the Old Testament at this point will be sealed, and nothing is supposed to be added to it. So when you say something like that, most people say, well, the Catholics, for instance, have extra books in their Old Testament, so do the Eastern Orthodox, things like that. Well, it's a nice place to put books to save them. Um, there's a lot of, and we'll look at it here in a little bit, there's a lot of Eastern Orthodox churches that stuck something in their canon. Uh, whether they really thought it was scripture, stuck it in there just to preserve it or whatever, technically it should not be added to the canon. And this is the story. Um, and so you have this uh, lineage of prophets, school of the prophets, that control these writings. They're supposed to be a public canon and then a non-public uh, library of books. And so let's, let's start by accepting that. It's um, the legend, of course, agreed upon by early church fathers, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, and then the Pharisee-Sadducee line. Uh, for this, and we definitely don't want to have cults add to the scriptures or anything else. So when we study, and, and I, I get this question a lot too, because I'll I'll say the early church fathers are something we need to pay attention to. Well, some of them had words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Uh, you could consider them prophets. We know Agabus was a prophet. Quintinius, the daughters of Philip. There were several other people that were prophets of that time. So if they wrote something down, and we happen to find it people would say, well, you should stick it in the canon. No, you shouldn't. The canon is closed for that time period. And we, the, we have the New Testament canon then, starting with the Messiah himself and his 12 disciples who write things. And one of the 12 disciples closes the canon with the book of Revelation. Now, later on in, in time, there will be debates. People will say, well, why do we have... Uh, and they, People do that today. They think that they have the, the authority to just change things. I don't think the church should really do such and such, so let's take a vote and change it. It's not your church, not your ability to change. Follow scripture. And so we have this kind of an attitude. So there were church councils later that decided things like, well, Third John, for instance, it appears to be nothing more than just a personal letter from John to some lady whom we don't even know, uh, who says, walk in the faith, there's no doctrine in it per se, it doesn't seem like it belongs in the canon, why don't we remove it? And so there's then there's this big debate on should we or should we not, and things like that. Those people are overstepping their bounds because they've forgotten the old legends. The books were put in there by prophets. So let's take a second. This uh, legend, like I say, is mentioned by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Essenes, and the Church Fathers, and is commonly accepted, but it comes from uh, the Ezra Apocalypse, which again is outside the canon. But again, that whole concept that a Church Father might give a real word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Uh, Enoch could have written the Book of Enoch, and it may contain prophecy for us today. Um, all those kind of things, but they still don't get added to the Old Testament or the New Testament. The book of Enoch specifically says that his book is to be kept separate from the series of books that the righteous live their lives by, in other words, the Testaments or the, um, the canon. So let's look at this. Let me just pull this up. This is uh, the ancient apocalypse of Ezra. It's called uh, Second Ezra in the King James. Now, the King James 1611 had your 39 books in the Old Testament, and then your uh, 27 books of the New Testament, and some of the things that the Catholics have added to their canon, and they did it simply because that's the way it was in the Septuagint, or some of the Septuagints at that time. 
Well, the King James, since it was debatable, pulled those pieces out, put them in the center, and produced a Bible that everyone could use. And you can read it or not read it, but you'll know that there's an Old Testament, a New Testament, and the disputed part in the center. Well, in, when they did this, you've got the Roman Catholic Apocrypha, and then you have the Ezra Apocalypse, which was added by the Anglican Church. It's, it's not found usually in the Eastern Orthodox, definitely not in the Roman Catholic, because it tends to be anti-Roman Catholic. Uh, but it was put in there to kind of balance the equation. But let's look at just one part of it, this legend about Ezra closing the canon, or what should or should not be added to the canon, or the idea of a public canon. Everyone should have a Bible. They should read it, but they shouldn't necessarily be reading other books. So if we go down here in the contents, we've got lots of things, lots of prophecies, lots of history. <clears throat> and there's a section on sacred books, uh, praying for inspiration and writing and these type of things. So the, the um, story here, we'll read part of it in a minute, but the story is that Ezra is asked of God to write the Old Testament. And people take this or get this from other sources and they get confused. I've heard legends like the Old Testament wasn't really written by Moses and all that, but the whole thing was made up and written by Ezra. Well, that's a perversion of this story, basically. And what we're, what we're understanding is that they, they had the entire Old Testament at the time. Everyone spoke Hebrew, and then because of the, the um, apostasy, they spent 70 years in Babylon. Then when they come back from Babylon, that generation spoke Aramaic. Aramaic is a sister language to Hebrew, but it's not Hebrew. Uh, a lot of you guys out there, for instance, want a modern English Bible because the King James is a little hard for you to understand. You can do it, but you'd have to read it two or three times instead of it just flowing. Well, Aramaic and Hebrew are kind of the same thing. Or if you speak Portuguese as opposed to Spanish, very, very similar. But you can tell they're not speaking right. So it's, it's a different language. So Ezra <coughs> comes back then and is commissioned by God to write copies of all of these things, the Old Testament and the other books, in Aramaic so that the people can understand them. That's the point. He's not writing the Hebrew canon because it had all been destroyed or anything like that. They've kept the sacred books, and sacred books have not been tampered with. They've been added to over the centuries by the prophets, and now they've come back, and Ezra is commissioned by God to write Aramaic copies. We call them targums of the scriptures. We have several targums of the Old Testament uh, now that have some interesting parts because later on people would add commentary into the targums. So the Hebrew is the actual scripture, the Ar Aramaic would be a commentary with, or I mean a translation with a commentary. Much like a King James, for instance, is an English translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. And then if you've got notes at the bottom of the Bible, if it's a study Bible, you've got the notes. So that's what the Targums are today, and the Targums are fascinating. Uh, some of the legends that they have that actually wind up corroborating the prophecies as the New Testament gives them. So they're fascinating to look at. But in this section here, specifically the difference between public and separate books, or the public scriptures. So let's read this. Let me run it up just so we can see it a little easier. And that should work, I think. There we go. So looking at the top here, um, and this is the, the public scriptures versus the other. So he's been commissioned to, to write under inspiration. He has asked, he's, I think there's five guys that come with him that are the scribes. That He's just going to dictate, and these guys are going to write. So here's what it says, starting in verse 37. It says, I took five men as he had commanded me. We went into the field, and we remained there as he told me. The next day, a voice called to me and said, Ezra, open your mouth and drink what I've given you to drink. I opened my mouth and saw and there came to me a full cup that was full of as, as if it were water, but its appearance was like fire. So he's telling you this vision that, he, that he's seen. It's not fire water. It's not alcohol. It's not an actual something on fire. This is a vision that he's seeing. Much like when Isaiah sees 
uh, the, the Lord on the throne and the seraphim, and he has the vision of the angel coming with the coal, touching his mouth to purify him. Now he's going to do something. Same thing here. So I took and drank, and when I drank it, my heart overflowed with discernment. My breast poured forth wisdom, and my spirit retained memory. My mouth opened and was not shut, but the Most High gave me understanding to the five men, and they wrote down the things that were dictated in order in written signs that they knew not. I sat there for forty days and wrote day by day, wrote by day. At night they did eat bread alone. However, I dictated by day, and at night I was not silent. Forty days, so this is the key verse here, in the forty-day period that the Lord allowed him to do this, in the forty days, ninety-four books were written. So, again, this is not tampering or rewriting the Hebrew we're writing, he is writing, uh, uh, through inspiration, uh, what the Lord is telling him to do, 94 books. So 40 days, 94 books. So how do we divide these 94? When the 40 days were completed, the Most High said to me, the first 24 books that you have written, make public. And a public means everybody should have one, should memorize it, it should be given freely to everyone, okay? But to those who are worldly, we're, I see, um, the 24 books that you've written make public, that those who are worthy and those who are not may read them. So it doesn't matter how godly they are, everybody should be reading the 24 books. And we'll explain what those are in a minute. But the 70 keep separate and allow only the wise men of your people to study them, for they contain the veins of understanding, the fountains of wisdom, and the stream of knowledge. So in this part, then, what, we, what we're seeing is that the first 24 that he dictated in Aramaic should be given to the people, common people. Everybody should have it. And this is the Old Testament. So people would ask, well, how come in the Old Testament, just the regular Bible, why do we have 39 books and they only had 24? It's a different count. So, for instance, you take our 39 books, what we call 39 books, uh, you have 1st and 2nd Samuel, which are combined into just the book of Samuel. you got 1st and 2nd Kings that are combined into the book of Kings. 1st and 2nd Chronicles that are combined into Chronicles. And then Ezra and Nehemiah is put together in a book, Ezra and Nehemiah. And then you've got the 12 minor prophets. We consider 12 separate books. And in the Hebrew and in these other copies, it's called the Twelve. There's one book with the Twelve Minor Prophets in them, and it's called the Twelve. So when you do that, you've got the same 39 books, but it's in a group of 24. It's kind of important to know that because there's 24 other 24 numbers in the uh, New Testament. For instance, uh, people always ask, what do the 24 elders represent? Maybe the 12 apostles and the 12 prophets or the law, you know, why, why 24? One thing to think about is that the Old Testament canon was closed the way they count it in, in the Hebrew thought as 24 books. So very important. So when I say that we take the 66 books of the Protestant canon, which is 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New, we want to specifically mention that, but it's the same as their 24. So, according to this legend, then, the 24, the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, was written also into Aramaic, the common language of the people, just like we have it in English, and it was to be given to everybody. So, this is a closed canon, not to be added to. There are other books, but are to be kept separate. Um, and we see that, because we see, and leaving out the New Testament, just in the Old Testament, we've got in Chronicles the book of Gad the seer, the book of Nathan the prophet, the book of uh, Hijah the shallow knight, uh, the book of, um, who else is there? Well, there's the, the five, and there, there's many other books. Book of Jasher is mentioned as a history book, etc. But it should not be added to the canon. And this is one reason why <clears throat> some people um, will put together a Bible, and many people have done this, 
and they've wanted to add a few extra books to it. And the, the Bible is supposed to be our rule and guide of faith, the infallible, un, the, yeah, infallible Word of God. And so adding something that's not infallible is not something we should be doing. And so anybody trying to do that I would much rather you have an Old Testament and a New Testament separate or together as a Bible and then have your denomination's extra books. I mean, we kind of sort of all, all, all have them. There's the Baptist faith and method, message, which is how they interpret the Old Testament. They'll say we believe in the perseverance of the saints and we don't believe in this, but we do believe in that. And it's their doctrine, whether it's right or not. It's what Baptists believe. And then there's the Nazarenes have their doctrinal statement, things like that. Calvary Chapel has a book called uh, The Distinctives, and it describes the philosophy of ministry, what is believed, why we want to study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. We mainly do Bible studies rather than sermons, whereas most people do mainly sermons and a few Bible studies. So that kind of stuff. So with that in mind then, so this is where that legend comes from. So the early church fathers, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes all have this legend that the canon was closed in the days of Ezra. This is the legend of what it's based on. And this legend says not only is the canon closed, but it's the 39 books as we look at them, or the 24 books as the, the Hebrews look at them, but it's the Old Testament as a whole was closed at that time, so you can't add to it. So it's the same reason why there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. The New Testament wasn't just a series of books that was tacked on to the end of the Old Testament, and we just have one canon, so to speak. There's an Old Testament that's closed. There's a New Testament that's closed. If uh, anybody's going to add to the canons uh, or add texts like that, what's probably going to happen is if you look at the prophecies, the next serious prophets that come along are going to be the two witnesses in the book of Revelation during the, during the tribulation period. So I would assume one of them or both or someone in the millennium may, may not, write extra books or another canon or something like that. A, this is how it all actually happened type thing. And that may or may not happen, but... Even if it does happen, it's not something we're going to add to the New Testament or add to the Old Testament. And people have said, well, in the old times, in the first age, we had the writing of the patriarchs. It was kind of like a canon. It was. And some people consider that the first canon, which was kind of lost to us. The doctrine is identical all the way through, so it's nothing really to worry about. So with this in mind, then, Old Testament and New Testament are closed. No one should be adding to them. No one should be producing a Bible that has extra books in it. There's a lot of extra books that we want to study that are very valuable for us in our time. Our early church fathers' words of wisdom, other prophets' prophecies, the school of the prophets, what they understood, their writings, their history, the Dead Sea Scroll, all that stuff. There's a lot of information we want to look at. Um... A lot of people will quote Josephus, for instance, and realize that no one's trying to add Josephus to the canon. But Josephus has some very interesting um, explanations, because he will tell you as an eyewitness what the Romans were doing and why, what their customs were. And that'll make sense in other places. On the other hand, though, his dates are off, when you because he's using the Greek form. So lots of things to think about. Um, going on down here, um, this is my explanation of, of what I, we just talked about. And let's see here. So I took a wild guess when I put this together, and this is my commentary for on the Israel Apocalypse. But the list of books that I found mentioned in Scripture and in the Dead Sea Scrolls that might be part of the Seventy. And so I basically have a list here of things. We know what, this, what the 24 are. So that's going to be Genesis through uh, Malachi, the Old Testament. Well, one of them in Josephus' Antiquities, he mentions the prophecies of Adam, uh, the prediction that the world would be destroyed once by a flood of water. 
once by a, a, a torrent of fire. Uh, but he wasn't sure which one was going to come first, but those were the prophecies. So for Josephus to mention that, it has to be written somewhere. Now we know the Dead Sea Scroll concept of the patriarchs, and Adam through Aaron wrote testaments to their kids, supposedly real, supposedly containing prophecy. We don't have a copy of the Testament of Adam, but this is obviously what Josephus is talking about. Now, I firmly believe somewhere on this planet there are a group of guardians that have the entire text. And what we have are the fragments that came from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So anyway, that would be the Testament of Adam. There were prophecies given by Canaan, according to Jasher. So there was probably a Testament of Canaan. Uh, Enoch, we have the full text from the Ethiopic and fragments of it from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so we know that there's the Testament of Enoch, or the Book of Enoch. Uh, maybe added to, maybe missing parts, but it existed. Uh, let's see here. Josephus talks about the Pillar of Seth, which is not actually a book, but something written in stone. But again, something that Seth or his children would have known about. Methuselah wrote a book, according to Enoch 83. Lamech wrote one, according to um, Enoch 106. We actually have part of the Testament of Lamech, part of the Testament of Noah. Uh, Enoch and Jubilees mentioned Noah wrote a book. Uh, Noah's book on herbal medicine is mentioned in Jubilees 10. That would be fantastic to get a hold of. It's mentioned, but I don't think we even have a fragment of it, unfortunately. Um, in Jubilees 12 and in 45, it mentions the books of the fathers. Those are just the testaments of the patriarchs. So Abraham wrote one. We've got part of the testament of Abraham, part of the testament of, a of Amram, um, Eldad and Medad, Janus and Jambres, Jubilees. Uh, there's several of these other things. Book of the Wars of the Lord, Book of Jasher, the Law of Kings. And if you think about it, when you understand the law of kings is the codified law for the king, for the government structure that the king runs out of the Torah, then you should have a Levitical one out of the Torah specifically for the Levites. And that's basically what the temple scroll is. So we need to get these things translated just so other people can know them. So law of the kings is pretty interesting. Nobody goes by it anymore, but it's a window into the way things were back then. It's important that you know things like Noahide law and Jewish law and the court systems. Uh, not to be practiced, but just to know they existed. Um, let's see here. And Genesis Apocryphon is actually uh, part of the testaments of Lamech, Noah, and Abraham. That was somehow were sandwiched together. There's the Annals of Jehu. Um, some of the Proverbs are in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Solomon and some of the Songs of David, Chronicles of David, uh, Chronicles of Nathan the Prophet. We have half of that now, uh, still trying to get the other part of it. Uh, History of Nathan the Prophet, Chronicles of Gad the Seer. We've, we got, I think, all of that. It's 14 chapters. We reproduced that two or three years ago. Um, Ordinances of Samuel probably is that Law of Kings, but it might be something else. Uh, prophecy of Ahijah, Ido, uh, Shemaiah, the other one, several things that they wrote. These are all just references of other books out of the Old Testament. Okay, and then that book there. So we have a list of uh, possibly 53. And these are ones mentioned, uh, but these are historical documents mentioned as being written by other people. So like Medes and Persians, that wouldn't be prophetic that... Ezra would be transcribing.